Amen. Awesome. Well, it is good to see you all, and uh, of course, you know what I'm about to say. What am I about to say? Awesome. Awesome. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to continue on in our message series called, does anyone know? Anyone? Anyone? Red Wall, Red Letter. So in case you're new and some new faces in here, you don't know what in the world we're talking about. So when you walked in the sanctuary, there was a, on the other side of that door right there, there was a red wall, and it said, together, let's ascend the mountain of the Lord. And that's what we're hopefully, hopefully we're at the peak right now. And you're in his presence, and you want to get down to his feet and listen to the Lord speak to you. And so Jesus does that in this thing called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, 7. And Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the creator of all things, he invites the disciples to come up and sit at his feet so he could teach them about human flourishing. Because none of us, no matter how many rules we keep, no matter how awesome God's law is, no matter, no matter how much we try to keep it, that's not going to do it. And Jesus is like, listen, there's essence behind these rules. There's a reason behind this. It's the why, not the what. And I want you law keepers to understand the why so that you can flourish as human beings. And so that's where we are. We're in Matthew chapter 7 tonight. And I just want to say in, in advance, just to kind of lay a foundation for the evening, I was reflecting back on 2018. And although 2018 has come and gone, right, the calendar year, no one's thinking about the numbers 2018 anymore. You're writing 2019 now. No one's thinking about 2018, but some of us will never forget the things that happened in 2018, right? I was reflecting on that this week as I was getting ready to do this with you, and I was thinking about one of the things that really swept through our country in 2018 that was really, really big apropos for tonight was this whole thing with Judge Kavanaugh. Wasn't that his name? And they were trying to put him in as a Supreme Court justice, and, well, that brought up a lot of emotion, didn't it? It, it got a little sicker in the room just now when I said that, right? It's like, you know, b both parties, like, spreading across the aisle right now, like, Republicans here, Democrats there. A lot of emotion tied up to that thing. Some people loved the guy, and some people hated the guy. Some people loved his, his opponents, and some people loathed his opponents, and whatever side of the aisle you fall on, and I really don't care what side that is, as long as you fall on the Jesus side, that's right. that was a good place for an amen, right? Or a that's right, you know, that's good. <laughs> Just remember, front row people, you know where section you're in. Okay, I need a little help here with my sermon. Don't let me do all the work here tonight, okay? So let's just voice it up a little bit. And uh, so... It doesn't matter what side of the fence you were on, what side of the aisle you were on. It stirred up a lot of emotion. And, you know, quite frankly, anytime you think about a judge or judging or anything like that, it stirs up a lot of emotion, right? Nobody, I, I won't make you raise your hand, but how many people in here have stood before a judge, right? Okay, we'll just say civil or criminal, right? Civil or criminal. Yeah, now the hands go up. You stinking liars. But listen, it's it, lots of emotion. Just thinking about that, right? Just thinking about going before the judge can kind of stir some stuff up, right? And usually it's not good stuff. So here we are tonight, and you're going to see in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, he's talking about judging. And so tonight's message is, here's the title. It's, Who Made You Judge? Who Made You Judge? You can put the enunciation, you know, wherever you want in that question and it's not good in any way, shape, or form, right? It's never a good feeling. Who made you judge? Who made you judge? Who made you judge? That's where we're going. Now, before you go there, though, I want you to, well, before we study that section, I want you to do me a favor. Keep your finger there and go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 because I want to lay a foundation that you need to get. We can build on this to get full understanding of Matthew chapter 7 and the content there, I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, just two verses. I want you to see this with your own eyes because we're going to need this. So in 2 Timothy chapter 3, right at the very end, it says this. You guys all there? Okay. I don't want to lose anybody. 
Don't listen to the old car salesman. Listen to God. Okay? You got a book. You got a book. You got a book. Those people don't know where that is, the people that do, help them. Please. Okay? You can even pull out your fake Bible on your phone and just look it up and Google it. It'll bring it right to it. Okay? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God. Some translation, God breathed. So 66 books, but how many authors? One, right? All, all scripture, that's the whole book in your hand. All of it is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Right, so it's good, right? Is that good? It's good. Now watch this. God uses it. God uses what? The Word of God. What, what, what part of the Word of God? All of it, right? God uses all of Scripture. I'm not trying to substitute what the Word says here, but we want clarity, right? So God would use all Scripture to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. Anything good that would happen in your life as a result of you saying yes to Jesus and accepting Him as Lord and Savior would come inspired from right here, from the book, okay? That, that's what it says. So now the, the, the key word to those two verses is what? Would you, would you care to guess? See so you can guess. Come on. Be gutsy. Be, be bold. That's close, yeah. Every. All. That's good. Same thing, right? All. That's the main word in those, in those two verses. All Scripture. All Scripture. Now, now, I understand that there's mountaintop verses in the Bible. You know, the famous ones. And then there's some really obscure verses in the Bible. Big mountaintops like uh, Philippians 4.13. I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? You got, who, whose favorite verse is that one? Anybody? A couple people in here. Um, John 3.16, you've heard of that one, I think, probably. For who's, right? For, for, what is it? I forget. Oh, yeah. So someone actually heard of that one? It's a popular one, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's pretty famous. How about Romans 8, 28? Everyone loves that verse, right? God, God's going to work everything out for the good. God's going to work everything out for the good, right? That's awesome. But you know, you know a verse you probably will never see? Um, Romans 8, 17. As a matter of fact, you might see some of it. You might see this on a t-shirt, the beginning. And since we're his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Isn't that awesome? That might make a coffee cup. And there's that word, but. But. Mm. But if we are to share his glory, we must, someone say must, must. also share his suffering. Mm. Mm, not going to make too many sweatshirts on that one. <laughs> but listen, what did we read before that? That all scripture is God-breathed and useful to teach us what is right and wrong. So, so do me a favor, pick a neighbor, pick a neighbor. And look at him and say, we need it all. We really need it all. Look at the other guy next to you on the other side. Don't neglect him. Tell them too. You don't want them to be, right? You don't want to shortchange them. We need it all. We need it all, right? Now, now listen, not just all 66 books. I'm not going apocrypha here on you. Not just all 66 books, but we need every single verse and we need every single part. And we need every single word. The Bible says that man cannot live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Every word. So we need Romans 8, 17. We must understand for us to grow and learn in our understanding of who God is and who you are, that you must, if you're going to share his glory, you must share in his suffering. And so, tonight we're, let's, let's go up the mountain of the Lord, right? We're going up the mountain of the Lord, Sermon on the Mount. And up on the mountain, we encounter a mountaintop verse. Hugely popular, but most often misunderstood. 
Matthew 7, 1, do not judge others and you will not be judged. King James, judge not that ye be not judged. Let me ask you guys a question, honestly, just honestly in church, please. How many people have heard it said this way? Exactly. Judge not lest you be judged. Raise your hands. It doesn't even exist, guys. Isn't that unbelievable? That just shows how naive and gullible and foolish we are. No, it's true. It's just another way of saying it. But those words have never been penned in the Bible. And every one of us almost in this room, in a church, said, I've heard that before. And it doesn't even exist. It, it, listen, this same verses are, are again stated in Luke, I think chapter 6. So I went back, I look on, on into those two, and into every version. In both accounts, never does it say, judge not lest you be judged. I'm saying that only because when you're going through life and you have a Bible, read it. Read the thing, man. It's food for your soul. It revives your soul. It brings joy to the heart. Insight for a living, right? You need this stuff. Don't be fooled into hearing something. You know, God helps those who help themselves. Yeah, it's so not true. You got it again. You just hook, line, and sinker. It's not true. You know, as a matter of fact, the opposite is true. God loves to help people who cannot help themselves, yeah. right? So, so, so don't just be fooled by this Christian ease that you hear, right? You have the word of God that speaks life into your soul. Read it and be, uh, be able to rightly divide this word. Know what it says, man. Everything depends on it. Everything. So do not judge others or you will, um, and you will not be judged. Of course, the uh, 21st century American version of false paraphrase, not true. It would say, only God can judge. That's what that Bible would say. Uh, the, the even worse version, uh, not true either, but there's the 21st century American um, version of independent autonomy. I am the center of the universe version. You guys hear of that one? That would translate this verse into, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> right? That's exactly, right? Being honest. Isn't that exactly what people use this for? Don't judge me. Don't tell me what to do because if you're not aware of it, I am the center of the universe. And you have no right to tell me what to do and what not to do. Listen, but if the truth is, and I believe that the scriptures are true, that all of scripture is necessary and needed to teach us what is right and wrong, right? Then we can't just read that one verse and tattoo it on our arm and tell everyone to leave us alone. We have to read the entire section of when Jesus is talking about this to have a full understanding of what he really says. Because if you're not living out the way he really says it, you're just shortchanging yourself and flourishing will not rush into your life. So let's read all of this. I'll start back in the first verse just to get it all, right? Remember, he's on a mountain and he's preaching. He is not, this do not judge others thing that's in black, that, Jesus never said that. That's us putting in little headings so we could find stuff in scripture. But he's up there just like I'm doing right now. I'm just like going, I'm, I'm on this rant, right? I'm on a rant. And Jesus was on a rant on this mountain. He was just talking to the people. And so you have to read all of this part. You can't just pick out one verse. He says, do not judge others and you will not be judged for you'll be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye? I'm going to correct that. Okay. It's not a friend. Okay. That is a bad translation. Okay. If you look up what it really said, it's another brother. Okay, Christian, okay, another Christian, a brother or a sister in Christ, okay, if anyone's in Christ, they're a new creation, the old has passed away, behold the new person, okay, why worry about a speck in your, in your brother or sister's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own? Hypocrite. Isn't that what everyone says we are? 
And that's what the world says each and every one of us in this room is right now more than anything else. We are hypocrites. And this is the reason, one of the reasons why people think that, because this is what we do. What's your problem? What's your problem? What's your problem? I don't know. Why don't you look in the mirror? What's my problem? So Jesus is like, you're a hypocrite, right? you got a log in your own eye. You're worried about theirs. He says, first get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Closes out this little section here before he starts talking about prayer. And he says, don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They'll trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Okay, so let's just make some observations about what Jesus says here. First and foremost, I just have to say that I believe that this is person to person. I don't think this is person to God. You judge people, God judges you. I don't think that's what it is. The reason why I say that is because I don't believe that that is the um, qualifier for God's judgment on people. I don't think he's not going to judge you because you haven't been judgmental. I don't think that at all. And it's not because of my little thought or my opinion. I don't think that he decides to judge people only because you have judged people. Okay? I don't think that's it at all. I think there's only one qualifier that brings God's judgment. And that is conception. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying conception. The moment of your conception, you were born. Do you understand that that's what the Bible that you hold in your hand would teach us? That's when you were born. At, I was born in iniquity in my mother's womb at the moment of my conception. Do you understand? So let me just tell you this. If you have been conceived, then you are subject to God's judgment. Okay? It's not based on whether you judge someone else. Not at all. And I get that from the scriptures, which is what we should get all of our answers. Acts 17, 31, you can jot it down. It says this, For God has set a day for judging the world with justice. The world, the world, the world. What, have you ever heard that one before? Doesn't that sound familiar? The world? Where did we hear that? For God so loved the world. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? Does he love the, the, the earth that he made? Probably so. Does he love the trees that are sprouting out of it? I would say so. Does he love the ocean? Does he love uh, the wildebeests? Does he love all those things? Yes, he does love those things. But in the context of the world, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So whoever would believe in him, right? You know that the earth doesn't have the option or the capability to believe in Jesus. Trees don't have the capacity to make a decision for Christ. So what is he talking about? He said, for, for, so whoever would believe in him, he's talking about people, right? The world is the people. And so when you go back to Acts 17, 31, for God has set a day for judging the world. For God has set a day for judging the people that live on the world, right? Was that, is that correct? God has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed. Who is he appointed? It doesn't say who he's appointed. Well, he, he proved to everyone, does that exclude anybody? No. Um, he proved to everyone who this is, this one he's appointed, by raising him from the dead. Well, Elijah, by the power of God, Elijah in 1 Kings 17, he, he raised this widow's child. Did you know that? That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, you know, Jesus himself in uh, John 11 raised Lazarus from the dead, right? He walked over to the grave and said, Lazarus, come on out, bro. And he comes walking out of there. That's awesome. But Peter, in Acts chapter 9, he raised this lady named Dorcas. If you're going to have kids and a girl, don't name your kid Dorcas. Look for a better biblical name than that. I was like, I grew up with Moses. That was rough. Dorcas would suck. I'm just saying it right there. Okay. So, but he raised Dorcas from the dead. And then Paul, 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 Paul. I love Paul. Paul's my favorite. Other than Jesus. Yeah, I get it. Paul's my favorite. In uh, Acts chapter 20, it says he's preaching, right? All night. All night. He's preaching so long that this guy, Eutychus, that's another lame name, but if you want, what it's better than Dorcas. This guy, this young man, Eutychus, he's sitting in a windowsill listening to, to Paul preach. And he starts to doze off. It's understandable. Some people in this room doze off sometimes. Just remember, I'm watching. I could pick on you. 
I'll throw something right at you, seriously. <clears throat> he falls out of the window and dies, right? And dies. So Paul steps down off of wherever he's standing and preaching, and he goes over to the kid and raises him from the dead, brushes him off. The kid walks away, right? You'd think, ah, right? Paul goes back and starts preaching again. That's, that, doesn't that just, like, you got to stop. Like, you know what I always say you should meditate on God's word? Like, stop for a second and meditate on that. What did that... What does that say to you? I know what it says to me. It says to me that the importance of preaching God's word is greater than if someone had a heart attack in here right now. Look at the silence in the room. Are you kidding me? It's biblical. The guy was raised from the dead, and the guy goes back and starts preaching more. He didn't stop. Well, you know, church is canceled. No. No, how important it is to get the words of life into the souls of the people in case they fall out the window. Right? So he keeps preaching. I love this guy. So all these people are raised from the dead. But let me ask you a question. Who raised Jesus? I mean, what miracle worker had the gift of the Holy Spirit for miracles and went to the, to the grave of Jesus and said, Son of man, come on out. Nobody did. Right? God did that. Jesus is the judge that was appointed. Jesus is the dividing line that determines your guilt or innocent. He's the one who's been appointed to judge. 1 Corinthians 5.13 says God will judge those outside of the church. Listen, I don't know when that is, but I know that there's a day. He will judge. He will judge. That day is coming. He will. It's future tense right there. And every time you read it, it's future tense, right? So I don't know when it's going to happen. I have no idea when it's going to happen. But there's a day coming. Now listen, I don't fully understand everything that is not explicitly clear in Scripture about God and about heaven and about hell. People in Christianity, they argue about heaven and hell and what it's going to look like. And is it going to be off in some far off place and everyone's playing harps? Or is it a new, new earth here, a paradise here? I don't know about hell. People argue that it's immediately, as soon as you take your last breath, if you haven't bent the knee to Jesus, you're going to burn forever. Some people think it's a far off time. I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this. Because it's clear that God will judge those outside the church. That there is a day coming. And if you have not bent your knee willingly to Jesus Christ as your Lord, then you are not part of the church. And you will be proven guilty before a holy God and sentenced to an eternity in a godless hell. And that should never be cheered because it's true, it should be cried upon because some might not bend their knee on your watch. You can't speak of the people who came before you, but you can speak of the people who are with you now. And you can speak of the future generations that would be impacted by those you would reach right now. And it should motivate you to action. Let me ask you this. That day's coming. Is that going to be a good day for you? Have you bent your knee to Jesus? Have you like a horse who's led around by a bit telling it where to go and where to stop and where to go and what direction, and you've been walking around your whole life with a bit called pride that's been leading you and make you feel like you don't need him? Have you spit that stupid thing out and bent your knee to Jesus as Lord? If you haven't done that yet, you need to do it. You need to do it and do it now. It's clear, Romans 3.22, that the only way to be made right with God is by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ alone. He said he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through me. That's out of Jesus Christ's mouth. You can't earn this thing. It doesn't make any difference how many good things you do. Righteous deeds, good deeds, helping old ladies cross the street. Isaiah said all of your righteous deeds that you try to do to make yourself good with God, they're filthy rags. Garbage, nothing, mess. Some people think that's a sanitary napkin that he's referring to. Think about that. 
awful. And that's why Paul, who gets this reality, he starts to elaborate on it in the book of Philippians to the people there in Philippi, and he would speak this to you today, who think that you don't need Jesus Christ. That maybe your good deeds or something other than Jesus would qualify you to be in God's good graces and to receive a spot in glory wherever that happens to end up being. And he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 5, he says, uh, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. God's chosen people, right? It's the first thing you got to get out of your mind and spit that bit out. You got to understand that it doesn't matter about your heritage and it doesn't matter what your grandma did. It doesn't matter. He says, I was pure blood Jew. God's chosen people, not good enough. Can anyone in this room claim to be God's chosen people? He goes on to say, I was a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees. These are the guys, they like memorized the Bible. We're, I'm just trying to get you guys to read it on occasion. These guys, that was what they did every day. They memorized, the, they were experts in the Bible, memorizing the Bible. So they weren't just Jews, they were like varsity Jews. I was a member of the Pharisees. Member means you, not everybody gets in, right? Privileged intelligent, wise, special, exclusive. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. And, and I was so zealous, like I, would, I wanted to get after this God thing so much that I, I harshly persecuted the church. Now listen, that's wrong, but he believed that's what the Bible was teaching, so he did what God said to do, or at least in his warped mind. And as far as righteousness, you know, doing good, being right, doing the good things that God would want you to do, being a nice guy. I don't know how you persecute the church and be a nice guy at the same time, but whatever. He said, I obeyed the law without fault. He's like, you know, I was purebred chosen, my heritage, who I am, my family tree. That gets me in. No, it does not. I was smart. I, I was a studied up guy and I was obedient. I was not a hypocrite. I actually did what the Bible said to do. And I should be rewarded maybe. Maybe I should be in God's good graces because of the things that I did. Rewarded for my doing. Rewarded for my serving. What does he say? I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, for Jesus' sake, I have discarded everything else. What does that mean? It means everything he just listed and more. Maybe the stuff he didn't even list. Maybe that's your thing that he didn't list. But everything else in his life, he threw it all away. Counted it as garbage so I could gain Christ. What he's teaching us here is that sometimes these things that you think you have that are going to make God happy and let you in, they're actually getting in the way of you getting in. You can't have Christ if something else is already the Lord of your life. So I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather... I become righteous through faith in Christ. So all these things, these qualifications that we all think we have, that's not it. It's in knowing Jesus as Lord. That's it. That's it. And that alone. So listen, there's a day coming for sure, right? There's a day. Let me ask you guys a question. When's that day coming? Yeah. I don't know. All these experts keep telling us when it's going to happen, right? <laughs> let them, let, let, God, you'll be, you'll, be, you'll be right and everyone else will be called a liar. That's what I say. I don't even know when it's coming. Do you know when it's coming? 
Anybody in here know when it's coming? Guess what? Let me just burst your bubble. If you think you know what you're talking about, Jesus doesn't even know when he's coming. He's waiting for daddy to go, hey, son, get to work. Right? He doesn't even know, so you don't even know, right? So if we don't know, here's a word for you. you taking notes? Are you taking notes? Write down this word. Motivation. Motivation. It could come before I finish my next sentence. It might not come for 20 years. It might not come for 500 years, but it could come before this sermon's over. Motivation to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Because once he comes, there's no chance. You're done. You're done. So, let's get back to our text here. Go back to uh, Matthew chapter 7. Just some more understanding, more truth. We live our life out right, don't we? Okay, so let's look at verse 3 through 5, and and because we want to understand the you know proper judging. I want to understand, okay, so he's talking about judging. There's a right and a wrong way. How do we properly judge, right? Who made you judge? Who made you judge? You want me to judge? What am I supposed to do? Well, if you look back at, uh, before we look at 3 through 5, look at verse 2 tells us that the, like the standard that you're judging is going to be a standard in which you are judged, right? So your standards are imposing on you as well, right? So what standards are we talking about here? We're talking about um, a word that church people don't use as much as they should, sin. We're talking about sin, right? We're talking about sin. We're talking about guilt. We're talking about where, where you're wrong, right? Nobody likes to admit that they're wrong, but that's what the Bible teaches. What's wrong? We're judged. If it's good, right? We don't need to judge that. It's good. <coughs> He's saying where your sin is, your guilt, right? And so the first thing we need to do, uh, uh, why worry about a speck in, a, in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of the speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. <coughs> First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you'll be able to see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So the first thing you got to do here for proper judging is you have to admit that you're a sinner. You have to admit that you have sin. See? You have to admit that you have sin. You, you can't puff up your chest and say, well, I'm better than that guy, and I'm better than that girl, and I don't really need it. I'm good. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, no, everybody has some sin in them. Everybody. 1 John uh, 1.8 says, if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. I don't like that version. I think some of the other versions better. It says, it doesn't say that we're not living in the truth. It says that the truth is not living in us. That's scary. Who cares about if we're living in the truth? What really matters is the truth living in you. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Like, he's not knocking on the door of those who don't think that they need him. Right? I came to save those who know that they are sinners, not the self-righteous ones who don't believe that they need me. Remember? Right? So if you claim that you have no sin, then there's no need for a savior. Jesus is not knocking on that door if you don't think he, you don't need me. Fine. Cool. I'll go after the ones who do know, the ones who realize that they're a sinner and need, in need of a Savior. I'll go after those people. The truth does not live in you. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory. All have sinned. That's what, past tense, right? And all, and look, it does, look, you know what it doesn't say? It doesn't say uh, all have sinned and have fallen short. It says all have sinned and fall short right all have sinned before and all are doing it now and all will do it later every time you read that verse it's still apropos right you read it today what does it say you fall short today you read it tomorrow you fall short tomorrow every single day you fall short you fall short you fall short romans 5 12 it says that adam's sin brought death to everyone right so listen, you have to, the first step in judging properly this sin is to ad acknowledge and admit that you have sin, okay? that you have sin. And once you realize and recognize and say, hey, God, I have sin in my life, what's the next thing you do? It's how do we deal with that? How do we deal with this sin in my life? So I would just say this, based on the text, my sin first, then yours. My sin first, then yours. Uh, not, not mine only, not yours only, uh, but first mine and then yours. First mine and then yours. So clearly, this whole idea of only God can judge, you need to throw that out. 
Because clearly based on this text coming right out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, we are called to judge sin. But listen, only in another brother or sister's life. You see it there, right? You see it there. Okay? Only in another Christian's life. And I would just say this too. This, it's not biblical, so this is not, I'm not quoting scripture. This is just me. Not only is it just other Christians, but I would just suggest to you that it would only be Christians that you have a relationship with. Okay? Don't go on another church's website or another church, another person's Facebook page that do not, they don't go to Revolution Church, okay? If they're going down to the cross over there, don't rip the guy at the cross for what he's doing because you don't have a relationship with him. And he's just going to tell you to go kiss off, okay? So don't cause the man to stumble. Leave him alone, okay? Leave him alone. we got enough problems right here in this room to deal with, right? We don't need to involve another 500 people. we got our own problems right here. So I would just say another brother or sister's life, and so we have to acknowledge our sin. That's number one. And then two, after me, then other Christians only, not Joe down the street who's never confessed Jesus, not your jerk boss at work who can't spell Jesus, but a brother, a sister in the Lord. We judge other confessing Christ followers who are sinning only, okay, only. But, but first me, but first me, right? But first me. Isn't it, so, isn't it so easy to point out other people's sin? That's our favorite thing to do. Uh, truthful, right? That's all we do all day long. Myself included. My wife and I are the worst. We're the chief of sinners. Well, maybe more her than me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love you. <clears throat> isn't that what we do? Yeah. Isn't it e- I mean, isn't it easy to find the sin in your kid all day long? Isn't it easy to point out the sin of your spouse? Not mine, because she's perfect. Isn't it easy to point out sin in our friends, and our Facebook friends, and politicians, ah, everyone, co-workers, everywhere? But where's the toughest place to point out sin? In the mirror, right? In the mirror. That's the biggest place. That's the biggest problem. But we all have sin. Every single one of us has guilt and wrongdoing. We all are guilty before God. The scriptures say that God's law proves that all people are guilty before a holy God. Every single human being, from the, from the, from the oldest lady who's a, who's a hundred something years old to the brand new newborn in the nursery, everyone is guilty and all have sin. It's just the reality. We need to fix it. You need to fix it. You know why? Well, one, because God says so, and two, like, everyone thinks we're hypocrites. We're trying to save the world, and everyone thinks we're hypocrites. Who likes the, who likes the, would you like it, honestly, if you came in here, and I got up here every week and led the offering, and you found out that my wife and I don't tithe here? How would you like that? Would you like to, would that, hypocrite, Right? How, how would you, do you like the, the, the lady or the man who is, you know, spouting out verses to people's faces and, 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 and on Facebook and they're spouting it out and then you find out, you know, she drinks too much and cheating on her husband. Hypocrite. Nothing good's going to come out of that, right? We have to fix our sin problem. First get rid of the log in your own eye, Jesus said. Notice what it says. What does it say about, so if I'm reading it, right, if I'm reading this, what does it say about your sin? What is it? It's a speck, right? It's a speck. It's, it's this. It's this. Here, Carl, come here a second. Come here. Here. I want to give you some sin. Let me give you some sin. Here's some sin, man. Why don't you come on up here? Come on up. Come on up. Have some sin. So the Bible says that everyone else's sin, right, now, I'm reading it, so, so you're reading your Bible, right? Yeah. So to you, everyone else's sin is what? Right here, right? It's a speck. It's a splinter, right? It's like a little shame. It's a little nothing. But mine, mine's a log. <laughs> this is mine, right? And, and the Bible, this is what it says. It's, it's, what's your sin? Tell me what your sin is. What's your sin? Pick one, pick one. Uh, stealing. 
stealing. You know what my sin is? Um, sometimes I get a little bit angry and I let, I let that dictate my actions. Now let me ask you a question. Who in this room think that stealing is worse than just someone who lets their anger get a hold of them sometimes? Just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this. How many people, okay, you're not God. I'm talking about you. How many people, if, if his is stealing and mine is murder of children, okay, whose is worse? Point to the person who, who you loathe the most. Come on, right? Me, right? Right? But yet, it doesn't matter which person's the murderer. It doesn't say that in the Bible, does it? It just says that the other person's sin is a speck, and mine is a log. And, and why would I, why would I, why would I, the murderer, go up to him and say, What's wrong with you, man? Why, why are you stealing stuff? What's wrong with you? Don't you know that that's wrong? Seems kind of stupid, right? I mean, I got a log in my face, and I'm complaining. Who? Thank you. So who would ever, you can clap for him. So who would, he did a great job. So who, who would ever do something like that? Who, we do, all the time. And Jesus says, you're a hypocrite if you do that. That's not drawing people to me, guys. That's pushing people away. Why? Listen, you know why you have a log in your eye and they have a speck and everyone else in the room has a speck and you have a log? Because your sin's worse than theirs. You know what Paul said? You know what Paul did? He was persecuting Christians, right? Does it ever say in the Bible that he actually killed a Christian? He watched. Did Maybe he killed Christians? Maybe. I don't know. But it doesn't say that he did. But he was a rotten dude, wasn't he? Was he a rotten dude? He was a rotten dude. Okay, he said he's the chief of sinners. Some translations would say, I am the worst sinner. Okay, so let me ask you a question, honestly. Don't you think people back then, like the emperor of Rome, who was leading his army to go to other nations and like mass genocide, just raping and killing and burning and just murder after by the thousands and hundreds of thousands of people according to us who's really the worst sinner here but yet paul who knows this because he's living in that time says somehow i'm the worst sinner because your sin is the worst do you understand because it, listen, everyone's sin is the reason why Jesus went to the cross. Do you realize that? But listen, but my sin is not your part of putting Jesus on the cross. Your sin is your part of putting Jesus on the cross. So your sin is the worst. And you need to acknowledge that your sin is the worst. That's why he says, get rid of yours first. Your sin first before you help anyone else. So I acknowledge that I'm a sinner first and foremost, and then two, I need to get rid of it. I need to get rid of it by letting God change the way I think about it, right? Now, aren't you going to ask me how that happens so I can give you a cute little anecdote or my advice? I hope that that's not what you're asking. I hope you're going to ask me for a Bible verse. Thank you very much. <laughs> Psalm 119, it's a Bible church. Psalm 119, verse 11. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The more you got a bunch of sin in you guys, and the more the word of God gets pounded into you, repetitive, consistently, over time, it purges out all the junk, less of me, more of you. That's what happens. you got to get that junk out by letting God's word enter you and get written on your heart. He says, if you, have, if you would hide your word, my word on your heart, you might not sin against me. My sin's a big deal. Your sin's a big deal. And you need to acknowledge that. Before you go working for Jesus, you've got to let Jesus work on you. Okay? My sin's a big deal. So back to uh, only God can judge. Don't tell me what to do. 
Look at verse 5. What it says there. Hypocrite! First get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Now listen. You're going to see here in a moment that it is your responsibility to help another brother or sister with their sin and get rid of it out of their life. But I learned something today. It was awesome. You ready for it? Okay. There's all kinds of versions of the Bible out there. They're all awesome and good. ESV, J King James, New American Standard, NIV, all that stuff. Whatever one you want to read, just please read one. Okay. But I was reading the NLT today, and I saw something there. And, and listen, it's a thought for thought, so it's just take it for what it is. But this is good. This is really good. But did you notice? It says that we need to remove the plank, the log from our eye, right? First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you can see well enough to deal with the speck in another's eye. So although we are sometimes called to help remove it, sometimes the best way to remove, help them remove the sin from their life is to let them see you dealing properly with the sin in their life. Get that? Is that making any sense at all? When someone says, deal with it, what are they telling you? The situation's not changing. It's not going to improve. Deal with it. Right? It's not going to get better. Deal with it. What's that mean? You have to get better because this thing isn't changing. And sometimes when God works on you, you're going to let them see that, and that's going to help them. With the, listen, if they're acting like a jerk to you, and you come back at them aggressively, is that going to help them with their sin? But if they're acting like a jerk to you, and you respond to that jerk with love, boom, then it helps them with their sin. Do you understand what I'm saying now? Yeah. It's to help you deal with it. What does it say? Take the plank out of your eyes so that you can see well, so you can deal with it. Maybe you need to deal with my crap. And maybe the way you deal with my crap will open up my eyes finally to see how I should be dealing with it. Oh, you do it right. I do it wrong. I'm fighting with my wife all the time. You give her grace. Hmm. Instead of calling me out, maybe I see how you act with your wife. And I say, hmm, they're getting along well, and we're not. I need to deal with it. So maybe that's what it is, too. But we are definitely called to help the other brother or sister remove the sin from their life who called you judge who called you who made you judge people don't like this but remember earlier i said in first corinthians 5 13 that god will judge right god will judge do me a favor go there for a second i want to read another verse that's right next to it first corinthians chapter 15 and chapter 5 excuse me look what it says first corinthians chapter 5 he will judge, but look at, look at verse 12. Are you guys all there? This is the part where it gets a little bit hairy. People don't like this. Don't judge me. Don't tell me what to do. But we, we're a Bible church. We want to do what the Bible says because we're going to worship him in spirit and truth. We have to do it the way he wants us to. He's got a mission for Revolution Church, and we have to do it the right way. He's given us a game plan. Let's be his soldiers. Let's follow his lead. This is what it said. Paul says, it isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. Paul the Apostle, the pastor, the church planter, says, it's not my job to judge the people that are not in the church, that have not yet bent the knee to Jesus. That's not my job. But it certainly is your, now he's taking it off of him, and he's speaking it to the church. Okay, that's you. And he says, it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. Do you see? So, is God the only judge? No, he's not. He's going to judge the people outside of the church. We are to judge those inside the church, not deciding who's in, right? To get into the church. That's God's decision, right? Who gets in? Who does? It's Jesus, right? He's the dividing line. But once you're in the church... Now responsibility goes to us. That's the way God has laid it out, okay? 
<clears throat> so, inside the church, those are the people that you judge. Listen, there's a massive difference between saved people who sin and sinners that aren't saved. There's a big difference between them. If you've not bent the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and embraced him on your cross for your forgiveness, then God judges you guilty and you're not part of his church and you're not going to heaven. But if you have accepted the free gift of God through Christ Jesus the Lord for everlasting life, then you are his church. And when you, a saint, sins, then it is the responsibility of your brothers and sisters in Christ to judge your behavior. You just read it, right? I didn't make this up. This is what it says. Now, for you who come to this church often, how do we do that here? Chapter and verse. Chapter and verse, right? Why is it chapter and verse? Because the pastor says so? Not at all. The reason why it's chapter and verse, the reason why when someone who's sinning, you go up to them with a chapter and a verse, is because let's first define what sin is. Is sin when you break my rules? What is sin? When you break God's rules, right? Where do we find God's rules? Right here. So, so if someone has sinned, they've broken God's rule, so that means we should go to them with God's rule and say, hey, listen, here's the problem. Here's the problem. You're breaking God's commands, his laws, not mine. So anything that's considered sin would be contrary to the Bible. So therefore, these right here, this, this is the tweezers that you use to remove someone's splinter. Right here, okay? And the false notion that only God can judge and don't tell me what to do, not only is it false, but the Bible and the, what it teaches, it would also go so far as to teach us that judging another brother or sister's sinful behavior is your God-given responsibility. And so therefore, if you neglect that, that is sin. Do you understand? And so we can't just push back from the table on this thing. And this truth is actually reinforced yet again by the Holy Spirit through the pen of the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1, uh, chapter 6, verse 1, where he says this, Dear brothers and sisters, so again, he's talking to the church. He's not talking to the people out there that don't know Jesus as Lord. He said, therefore, brothers and sisters, in other words, Christians, right? If another believer, not a person, not a friend, not a family member, no. If another believer is caught up, overcome by, whatever your translation is, overtaken by, trapped by some sin, you who are godly, uh, some translations would say those who are spiritually should, you know, what does that mean? Those who know better, man. You know better. Like, you know the truth. Maybe you've been delivered from the same sin. And someone came to you and told you what it was. And now you've been delivered by the help of the Lord. And so if you know better, what do you do? Scream at them? Yell at them? Call them names? Tell them they're going to go to hell? You're going to hell. There's enough of that, right? He says, if those who are another believer, those who are spiritual, godly, should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path, right? So I was thinking about that, like gentle and humble, gentle and humble. What does that look like? What does gentle and humble look like? Let me tell you what it doesn't look like. Check this out. Because I'm putting that woman in time out. Oh, you're in big time timeout. God's going to throw you in hell forever, which is the ultimate timeout. In hell forever. Nobody will hear this thing in hell. Nobody's going to hear you when you're burning. When you're burning in hell forever. Because you refuse Jesus. Because you refuse Jesus. Hey, get the guys away from the homos. We know what these homos do to animals. They are sick and disgusting. If you support homosexuality, you are a Nazi. You are an anus 
Nazi. Yeah. You are, because it's just wicked. I mean, it's perversion. Jesus Christ, the reason for Christmas. I'm not religious. I don't, you know. Jesus but Christ is the one that died on the cross for you. I do think. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. I do think. And when Jesus comes back, he's throwing most of you guys in hell. I do think Jesus said judge and yet you know not be judge or something like that. Not this guy really. here. One sin is all it takes to go to hell. This guy here. A million ways to hell. A million ways to hell. One way to heaven. Jesus Christ. Right. Yeah. Gentle and humble, right? Just screaming at people that don't know Jesus that they're going to go to hell. Gentle and humble would be maybe maybe ponder in, in, in if Jesus doesn't want hypocrisy, then am I caught up in that sin? Like, am I guilty of that too? Has has God, you know, helped me and delivered me in my sin so that I could see these people properly and help them? Maybe. Humility and gentleness sounds like, brother, I was right where you were, and I needed God to help me. And when I was in despair, I read this verse, and it just poured life into me, and I pray that it does the same for you here. Maybe that's what we need to do rather than screaming at people. I mean, clearly this whole text is screaming aloud about human flourishing and interaction. And that right there, if you support homosexuality, you're a, he said you're a heinous Nazi and you're going to hell. I don't think that's going to draw too many people into the kingdom of God. <coughs> at all. So let's, um, let's kind of finish this thing up. Let's look at verse 6. <coughs> He says some really harsh words here, but, you know, stop and, and learn and study it and find out what re Jesus is really saying. He's not calling people pigs. He's not saying that they're unholy as in despicable or I hate them. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They'll trample the pearls and then turn and attack you. I think what he's trying to tell us here is like quit chucking your Bible at hearts that haven't been saved. They're just going to call you a self-righteous jerk. We've probably all experienced that at one time or another where you quote the scriptures and they just hate you for it. But here's the deal. The reason why that moron is just that is because even though he's holding a sign for Jesus and even though some of the things he's saying are true, like there's only one way, I get that. But obviously he needs to pick up his Bible and read it. Because here's what it says. 1 Corinthians 2.14, I'm reading out of the NIV. It says, the person without the Spirit of God does not accept these things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit of God. So how is that moron who's screaming at this gay guy to understand what he's talking about when he doesn't have the Spirit of God in him. You're going to, you're a, you're an anus Nazi and you're going to hell. Well, here's the thing. In his present condition, he may be going to hell, so he doesn't understand what you're saying. So it's not going to work. And so screaming with a bullhorn, bullhorn is just like screaming with a bulldozer. And it doesn't work. And, and this thing, this, it says here that they, not only do they trample the pearls, so they treat it as worthless, what you tell them, but then they turn and attack you. We see that played out all the time now, increasingly more and more in America. You know, like, we'll quote a scripture, either to a person, to a group, or maybe even on Facebook, and we'll quote a scripture because it's true and good, and we know that. That's awesome. But we get this aggressive response back, right? They come with teeth now. And they're, they're hollering at you, and they're like, take your closed-minded bigotry and, and stick it where the sun don't shine. I mean, you get it all the time. Religion is a crutch for the weak-minded. Yeah, I just was trying to help, you know. It's ancient caveman thinking. We're progressive now. 
God's just some egomaniac in the sky who demands obedience. Ooh. Don't impose your hate, hate talk on us. We're past all that. So clearly here in this teaching in Matthew 7, Jesus is definitely teaching how his people, not outside the church, but how his people are to interact so as to promote flourishing relationship vertically between you and God, the person that you're trying to help, and God, and with each other horizontally. Do you see it here, right? This is not for those outside of the church. So, I ask you again, as we finish up here tonight, who called you judge? Who made you judge? That's the question. And I would just have to say this. God did. God made you judge. And you're on the job training for proper judging so you can execute it properly so that his will would be done is for you to first deal with your own sin. That's what we have to do. Deal with your own sin. Listen, church, we don't want to back away from this responsibility. We don't want to push back from the table and say, that's not my job. It is your job. It's all of our jobs to judge the sin within the church. Sin's a massive problem. And, and part of this, your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven, part of that is that sin has to die in you first and then in others. And so I want to pray with you right now and I want to give God the opportunity to deal with you because your sin is massive and important, right? Your sin. Not my sin. Not the sin of the spouse that's sitting next to you. Not even the person you know who's in this room who you know is at fault right now in an area of their life. It doesn't matter what their sin is. God says that the sin in your eye is a log and that their sin is a speck. And if we want heaven to come, if we want his will to be done here at Revolution as it is in heaven, we've got to get rid of our own sin first. And so, Lord, I would just ask right now that your Holy Spirit would come in a powerful way and in, this, in these quiet moments that you would deal with us and you would begin to point out the areas of our life that are sin and guilt. And we understand, Lord, that we have been brought into your presence, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. But we understand, all of us, we understand that this umbrella of protection over us of Jesus Christ and his blood, we understand that it's there. We understand, Lord, that you look at us and see that, and so we rejoice in that reality. But we also know, all of us know, that under this umbrella of protection, is us, me, still sinning, still doing wrong. So Lord, I would invite you now to point out the log that's in my eye. And I would ask that you would do the same in everyone's eye right now.